Good evening and welcome to everyone. My name is Nick Conway, and as the chair of the Leadership Council for the USC Price Athenian Society, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, to the speaker series of events, for, and this is our final one for the academic year. Tonight's event, I bring together two of the university's most noted scholars, one who has perhaps done more to shape our understanding of California's rich past and, and a, than that of any living historian, and one whose research and insight in redefining common assumptions about California's future in order to give each one of us tonight a new perspective that will enable us to better be informed and more engaged citizens in our great state. It's my pleasure to introduce the dean of the uh, USC Price School, our very own Jack Knott. Jack is the C. Irwin and Iona Piper Dean, a professor of the USC uh, Price School. Before joining USC, Jack served as professor of political science and director for the Institute of Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus. He's a leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy and public management. He has published three books, including Reforming Bureaucracy, The Politics of Institutional Choice, and numerous journal articles and book chapters. He has held fellowships from the Russell Sage Foundation in New York City and the International Institute of Management in Berlin. In 2007, Dean Knott was elected as a fellow to the National Academy of Public Administration, a nonpartisan organization chartered by the US Congress to assist federal, state, and local governments to improve their effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. For a man who does not need an introduction, nevertheless, let me introduce our Dean, Jack Knott. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nick, um, and thank you uh, for your able leadership this year of the uh, Athenian Society. It is very much appreciated. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the USC Sol Price uh, School of Public Policy, I want to thank all of you for joining us for this uh, special event of the Dean Speaker Series. I also want to thank the Athenian Society for hosting this event uh, on the discussion of the past, uh, history, and the future of the great state of California. Uh, to me, this is uh, uh, really a perfect venue for holding this discussion. As you know, the Catholic Church uh, has in, entrenched roots in uh, California. It's 21 missions uh, along that stretch along the coastline of California have been uh, critical in the formative chapter of uh, California's history. So in this way, the new and contemporary architecture of the cathedral is really both symbolic of uh, California's rich heritage as well as the vibrancy of the present and the hope for the future. So we like to choose places that represent the theme of the particular uh, speaker series. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to take a few moments to uh, acknowledge a few people here uh, who are special guests with us uh, in attendance. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, some uh, members of the Board of Councilors. And uh, I would, uh, I'm going to start with Yvette McCarthy, whose uh, husband, Kevin, is on the board. So Yvette, uh, welcome. And then also Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas is here with us tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. We also have Price faculty, Kathy Kolnick, and our own Adal Myers, uh, so we're pleased that they could join us as well. And members of our Athenian Leadership Council, uh, Nick Conway, who you just met, Megan Loper, Glombeck, and Brisa Sotelo-Vargas, uh, members of our Leadership Councils, so thank them as well for their support of the school. And then uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the USC Price Development Team uh, for making this event happen. And so I'd like to thank especially John Sinego, Heidi Rosano, and Megan Golding, Glenda Silver, Silva, and Jenny Eccles, who worked very hard to make all the arrangements for this event. So could you thank our uh, Price staff? <laughs> You know, in his book, The Epoch of America, published some 80 years ago, 
uh, noted historian John Truslow Adams popularized the term the American dream, which he had defined as, and I'm quoting him, that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement, a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position." Unquote. It's a strong statement. And for many, many years, this American dream characterized what people thought about and saw in our great state of California. It captivated them, and it's what drew them here over many, many decades. And although some have today per perceived that the Golden State has lost some of its luster, we want to examine tonight some of the reasons to look forward to the future with hope and even see some of our challenges as important opportunities. Tonight encompasses many aspects of our school, demographics and immigration, governance reform, financial sustainability, economic development and employment, social policy, civic engagement, and housing and real estate. We're gonna to touch on all of those issues. And our panelists will address the question, how can California prepare for a future that's already here? You know, by some measures, California is in a state of crisis. The economic, social, and governance challenges facing the state are urgent and daunting. And it strikes me also that among some of us, the narrative of California's future is growing increasingly pessimistic, as though the best days are behind us, and while we have always rebounded in the past, could this time be different? And indeed, in the lobby, I talked to at least two people who expressed that very sentiment. And I, but I believe our panelists tonight have a more co complex and possibly different view. For example, rather than holding on to the anti-immigration sentiment so loudly expressed in the presidential campaign, it may very well be that in California, it's best interest to promote an intergenerational partnership and craft a new socially cohesive narrative that allows disparate groups to come together to develop a shared future for California. So in this regard, we're going to be exploring the increasing reliance of the baby boomers on younger, heavily minority generations to support the fiscal future of the state. In addition, we will examine the significance and the relevance of the American dream today, key policies such as Proposition 13, and the implications of past practices for reform of our government institutions for the future. So now I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers and leading us in our discussion has been, has been mentioned. This evening are two prominent scholars, educators, and uh, truly uh, public intellectuals. Professor Dal Myers is a demography and urban planning professor at the Price School at USC. He is a leading expert in the fields of demographic change, immigration and assimilation, and the future of California. He is also the director of the Population Dynamics Research Group in the Price School. His 2007 book, Immigrants and Boomers, Forging a New Social Contract for the Future of America is widely cited. And his recent research projects has focused on the upward mobility of immigrants to Southern California and the many changes they bring about in the city of Los Angeles, as well as projections of future impacts on the state's growing population. He has uh, authored articles in the New York Times, as well as the Los Angeles Times, and he's testified before Congress on immigration and other issues, and has become a major voice for understanding immigration and the future in California. And he has a much anticipated new report, he tells me, coming out tomorrow on the project, latest projections for California. So hopefully, if we can persuade him, he will give us a sneak peek preview of that uh, report tonight. Uh, Kevin Starr is the California State Librarian Emeritus and University 
Professor of History at USC. With his primary appointment in the History Department, but Kevin has also had a long and close relationship with the Price School and teaches in the Price School still to this day. In addition, he is serving as the new director of the Sidney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Studies at USC and as the Associate Dean of the USC Library. So he hasn't slowed down at all since be, uh, being state librarian. While doing all of those things, Kevin is most noted, as was already mentioned, for his research and writing on California history, the history of American culture, urban history, and government. He's a prolific author and he has written numerous books on the Golden State, addressing how it emerged from the gold rush, absorbed the shocks of the Great Depression, and was transformed by World War II. His six-volume series titled Americans in the California Dream captures the enigmatic blend of dreams and reality that loosely describes California. He is also a contributing editor to the Los Angeles Times. And in 2010, and a picture that I still love to see. Um, Kevin was inducted into the California Hall of Fame by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. So uh, please welcome our panelists. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, California faces numerous challenges. Uh, it faces high budget deficits, uh, gridlocked legislature, high unemployment, low performing public schools, and other serious issues. Yet uh, both of you, I think, from knowing you and what you have written and talked about, are more optimistic than most Californians about our collective future. So I'd like to ask each of you to tell us one thing to begin that we might not know that would make us more optimistic about our state's future. Well, I was more optimistic until you chronicled all the difficulties the state is <laughs> no, I'm not so certain, sure. Well, I'm, of course, optimistic by temperament. And I also know uh, history can't give us a, a straight line to the present and future. But I also know uh, from, from historical background that the state uh, faced similar t times like this. And I'm saying, for instance, that uh, in uh, 1849, when the gold rush came, we, we were a military territory. The, the governor of the state was the senior military officer. Uh, Americans, uh, the, the Congress would not give us, we had legislative gridlock, because the southern states wanted uh, slavery south of the Tehachapis. The northern states said California is a free state. So there was no territory, a uh, territorial government. That was a crisis when the gold rush came and some 300,000 Americans came in to California. They wanted trial by jury. They wanted, they didn't want to be governed by the military. They hadn't done anything wrong. They didn't want to be under martial law. And uh, par paradoxically, it was the general, General uh, Bernard Riley, Bennett Riley, who said to, to for form yourself a government. And he acted where Congress could not. He did an end run around the whole system. Now, uh, in in and of course, the government was formed in in uh, in, in Monterey. And then, in the eight, by the mid-1870s, that Constitution of 1849 was antiquated. It wasn't, wouldn't work. And California was on the brink of, in this case, true insurrection. You had the uprisings in San Francisco in 1876 of the Working Men's uh, uh, Association. You had uh, the United States Navy putting two gunboats off shore in San Francisco because things got very uh, dicey in the city in terms of rioting back and forth, the anti-Chinese riots. And you had an international uh, situation and a national situation. You had the Communard in Paris in 1870, where the where a, 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 a extreme left group seized Paris and and ran it for about 18 months, and it was suppressed by the military at, at great cost. Some 22,000 people estimated executed. You had the railroad strike in the United States in 73, 74. Uh, President Hayes argued, uh, offered the uh, sent the troops out against the strikers when they seized the government of St. Louis. This is what I love. See, uh, today's problems don't sound all that bad, right? Uh, <laughs> seized the government of St. Lu Louis and declared it was ruled, being run by a Soviet because that language was now available through the first international, which had been formed in the early uh, 1870s. So you had an international 
philosophy of, uh, of, uh, of revolution, literally. Uh, um, and then uh, in uh, 1899, David Starr Jordan, the founding president of Stanford University, writing in Atlantic Monthly, uh, talked about the various the political corruption, the political machines in California, and he said that the state is not going to read its destiny until it has up-to-date government, but I don't know how it's going to happen. Short uh, uh, years later, a group of young lawyers got together in Levy's Restaurant Cafe here in Los Angeles, so they formed the Lincoln Roosevelt League. By 1910, they had seized, who Hiram Johnson elected uh, the, uh, governor, and they seized control of the Assembly and the Senate. And between 1911 and 17, they gave us the system that has operated until now, until this day. So those are very dramatic examples of, of, of end runs uh, or, in effect, uh, uh, times of timeout. Now, I thought we were in, a, in a, a condition of timeout now in California where we renegotiated the public sector. What we're doing now is, is renegotiating the public sector. And I don't want anybody to think that I have a political bias on this because I'm a registered Democrat, but I was appointed a state librarian by a Republican, Pete Wilson, and then reappointed by a Democrat, um, Gray Davis, and then reappointed by a Republican, Arnold Schwarzenegger, which testifies to the flexibility of my political opinions <laughs> <laughs> and, and my commitment to long-term employment. Or the, lack of the, <laughs> or the lack of the centrality of the library to the, the political... The, the, uh, or, the, or, or just the center, <laughs> the center in general. The center in general, and I did, was very happy to work on speeches for each of those three governors. Mm -hmm. Had no trouble because they all were instinctively centrist personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 I thought that we were going to have a negotiation, a time, another timeout, where we renegotiated the public sector in California because it, it, the, uh, the public sector had grown in terms of, uh, of entitlements, and that word, I, I do not use any derogatory word, uh, since there are certain times when government must take <coughs> care of the sick, the, the blind, the lame, and the halt. Uh, that, that, that particular culture derived its excess capital from this extraordinary rise of California to world status from 1945 to 19, what, 75, 85, when it became a nation state, a world state. And it crept up on us. And I think it's very important uh, that, the, that to those who are suspicious of that said, Look, time out, let's renegotiate that. Now, that renegotiation process has occurred for about 10 years now. It, it to a certain extent, uh, defeated the best hopes of Arnold Schwarzenegger that he could, through charisma, uh, renegotiate the Senate through his own personal uh, charisma, although uh, Arnold left the office with the reforms in terms of primaries that are going to have a long, long-term term effect. Uh, but uh, right now, I think we are where David Starr Jordan was in 1899, writing about California, the president of Stanford, where he said, correction, uh, correction must come, but I don't exactly see the scenario yet. So I have, since we have gone through these things before, and since the private sector of California, has there ever been a, a, a gathering of more talented, up-to-date, hip, to include all the MRED graduates who are here tonight, the, the <laughs> self-assured, shall we say, uh, Californians that we have? And to, will all that, uh, to say, to postulate that all that energy in the private sector that is run so vitally through our motion pictures, our novels, our, our poetry, our architecture, our city planning, uh, our university development, and our own USC. Look at, look at our own case study of this university over the last 20 years to, to include your own distinguished uh, tenure as a, a dean of the Price School. Uh, th that all that will not find a way. Now, is that, that's not coming up with the way, but it, but it does suggest that, that the, uh, the dysfunction of government now doesn't mean that the total society is dysfunctional. Doesn't mean that California is totally dysfunctional, but there is a dysfunction of government because this time out has gone too long. Now, uh, what we could do possibly is to maintain uh, the current attitude where a very small amount of people pay the vast majority of, of uh, taxes for the state and we could pass that law that's coming that, that's coming up before the voters, and by another 10 years or so. Uh, but that doesn't solve the long-term problem of renegotiating the public sector. One last point: the New Deal came late to California. This was fi primarily a Republican state uh, all throughout the 19th and 20th century. Even when the Working Man's Party called for a constitutional con uh, 
uh, convention in 1879, and the Working Men's Party was, was definitely uh, on the left, uh, they were able to do this because they made alliances with the Republicans. Uh, uh, and 16 Republican delegates were at, the, at that convention. So uh, I'm just saying that we, we have to be patient, uh, and if we want to sort of just kick the can down the road, we can uh, by, by, uh, by um, uh, 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 taxing the so-called rich, um, but that doesn't solve the fact that we haven't renegotiated that covenant. California covenant has to re renegotiate. Now, I think the renegotiation, if we could get politics started again from the center, that negotiation uh, could be done. I mean, the, the state is not, uh, there are certain uh, fringes on left and right, but that's, that's beside the point. There's this great center in California, this great center in America that sees a proper role for government, a proper role for the private sector, that doesn't want to destroy business through excessive regulations, that believes that paying taxes is a privilege, and it's dangerous morally and psychologically when 50, 60 percent of the population pay no taxes, even if it's just a a, a vestigial tax. Uh, I think all, all that can, w will come forward and people like uh, Dow can uh, tell us how it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Oh. All right, you're, you're teed now, up. I know I'm only supposed to say one thing that's optimistic. And so I won't tell you that yesterday was Earth Day. <laughs> and I won't remind you about the incredible attractions that we have on the California coast. He's done a pretty darn good job protecting the coast. And I won't remind you about the mountains we have. Now, Kevin doesn't think of these things because he's a native Californian. He grew up with this. He takes it for granted. I'm from Florida. Do you know what the surf looks like in Florida? <laughs> they don't have surf. They call it a bay, Biscayne Bay. Uh, I lived in Texas for five years, too. And so I can tell you what California's big hope for the future is it's the natural resources that we have here that make this place so much more attractive and livable than Texas. Texas may be doing great in the short run, but in the long run, uh, with or without global warming, in the long run, it is going to dry up. Um, but I'm not going to say any of those things, because that's beyond my limit. <clears throat> I want to emphasize instead that we also have the human resources for the future, for the next 20 years. Unlike the other states in the country, California has a much younger population. All those kids we spent that money educating are going to be the workforce that we're going to have going forward here just in time when these baby boomers retire. When they retire, the whole country is going to be searching for workers. And I, I, you know, we already saw it in previous decades. Um, New England ran out of workers uh, for a while there, and the, the upper, upstate New York is losing population. And, the, the Midwest doesn't have any extra workers. When the baby boomers retire, they're going to be sucking wind in all those locations. The economic vitality is going to be in the locations that can maintain a good workforce and ample supply. I only have a couple places in mind right now. One is Austin, Texas. It's always going to have young people. And the other one is California that has all these young people. And there's a secret ingredient here, was that many of our young people happen to be Latino. And those of you who have Latino friends or who are Latino, you know there's a great family attraction. But the data also shows that Latinos are half as likely to move away from their home state as everybody else. They're going to stick. And they're going to stick here in California, and that's going to provide the workforce that will make employers come here because we have the people. We have the workers, as long as we educate them. And it comes back to Kevin's point about having that public sector renegotiation to revitalize that compact. If we don't take, make an investment in this new generation, we don't get those benefits, which we should. We, we are owed those benefits, but we owe it to ourselves to make the investment first. If I'm optimistic, we'll make the right decision. I don't know why, because <laughs> of people like Kevin, but, the, but the, 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 the play is there to be made. You just have to make the play. All right. Um, now, I know that both of you uh, in your work, and it's certainly true in Kevin's work, uh, as a historian, but it's also true in your work, Dal, as a demographer, uh, you use the idea of narrative. And uh, you talk about changing narratives that affect public policy and that affect political views of society. <coughs> so I'd like you to say just briefly uh, what this t term means to both of you, 
Uh, and why is the idea of narrative important? And then we'll get into talking about a couple, three narratives that are affecting California today. Narrative is a very uh, easy way to, to dramatize uh, uh, more complex problems, which if you start to break down and, and engage in complex uh, arguments, etc., you lose uh, your, your, your interlocutor. You, you, he or she is not going to be interested. For instance, I'll, let me tell you a story. And once upon a time, there was a man named Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was very su uh, suspicious of, uh, ex of waste in government. Ronald Reagan was very suspicious of um, misuse of government resources. But Ronald Reagan also was um, a great admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. And Ronald Reagan, as governor of California, uh, presided over one of the most significant developments in growth, uh, uh, what he would consider proper growth for California. And Ronald Reagan, as president of the United States, uh, presided there. Once upon a time, there was a president named Richard Nixon. Now, President Richard Nixon had uh, problems later on in his administration. But before those problems surfaced, uh, President Nixon, uh, who ran against government and was against government waste and had a, a hard line towards uh, excessive expectations of government, uh, promoted the uh, Health, Health Maintenance Act, promoted the uh, Endangered Species Act, promoted the Model Cities Act, all, 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 all during, dur during his time, and lo and behold, got on an airplane and opened up relations uh, with China, whom just a few years earlier we'd been facing across the battlefield in Korea. So what's that a story about? That's a story that, uh, that say, for instance, I, as a centrist, w could tell uh, a, a conservative in terms of hardline negotiations that there once upon a time was the state of California uh, that was governed by Republicans. Uh, uh, the Republicans uh, were the dominant party and, and dominated uh, all, uh, I, I tell this story in my current book, uh, dominated all the uh, offices, statewide offices, through the 1960s uh, and, and in, the, in the 19th century as well. But through the certain 1960s, they had one Demo two Democratic governors in, in the 20th century. <laughs> and those Republicans were cautious uh, they were they were very alert to the limitations of government. They didn't worship government, but they handled government spectacularly. Uh, they handled gover governors like Earl Warren. Uh, in fact, was so popular that in 1946, under cross filing, he won the election, the Democratic and Republican nomination. He would have had to run against himself, <laughs> or his successor, uh, Goodwin J. Knight, who had the strong support of the old-fashioned real unions. Not public sector unions, but miners, steel workers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, uh, had all that support and uh, did, uh, did very well as government. Now, those narratives are really narratives about the fact that uh, uh, Republicans, to include California Republican Herbert Hoover, who just before leaving office uh, made a grant of $79 million reconstruction finance money to California to construct the Department of Highways to construct the uh, the um, San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. In other words, narrative begins to suggest narrative begins to suggest that uh, to to Republicans, uh, just like you could suggest to to uh, Democrats. Once upon a time, there was a Democrat named Harry Truman who believed that government uh, should take care of the sick, the blind, the lame, and the halt, but who hated waste, hated corruption investigated it as a senator from Missouri during World War II, uh, pre, uh, uh, took on the unions with the Taft-Hartley, uh, invoking the Taft-Hartley Act during the steel strike. So you t there's, a, there's cross narratives there of very, of, of very highly developed politicians with solid bases, solid philosophies, who uh, em embarked. I'll give you one more. Uh, once upon a time, there was a Republican named Dwight Eisenhower who created the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and who uh, fostered the National Highway Defense Act, uh, which uh, today has ringed our, uh, uh, crisscrossed our nation with, with great highways. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the narrative involved here? The narrative is of negotiation, of political leaders who sought the art of the possible, which both Aristotle and Bismarck tell us is the essence of politics, uh, not ideology, not lines in the sand, 
But what can we do without asking our uh, opponents or, or our, our colleagues, shall we say, on the other side of the aisle to give up basic values on their part? So that's called politics. That's called negotiation. You do it all the time in the university as the dean. So I think narrative anchors. We need to re sort of recast our, our narrative of political affiliations here and realize that the Republicans ha w were very good, very conservative, and had a genius for administration of government, and that Democrats were very concerned with the sick, the blind, the lame, and the halt, but loathed waste in government and were very effective, uh, especially uh, Governor Pat Brown, uh, very effective in guiding this state to uh, nation state status. But it sounds like the narrative that you're talking about is a narrative of compromise and deliberation. And yes. Oh, I love it when you talk that way. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yes. And that. Absolutely. That's and, called politics. And have, have, is, have we lost some of that today? Uh, that well, we've lost the ability to be political. Uh, if, if, we de if we draw lines in the stand to each other, if we demonize the other all the time, if, the, if, uh, if uh, you know, in, in the old days, the elected officials up there, they were, maybe they drank a little too much Maker's Mark, right? And, they, <laughs> and, uh, and other things. And other things, and they sometimes consorted with uh, uh, the demi-mondaine, uh, and they <laughs> went to Frank Fats and stayed up all night uh, eating Chinese food, et cetera, and smoked big cigars, but look what they did. They passed legislation, Republicans and Democrats alike, working and, and giving and taking, back and forth, not, and not sacrificing core values on either side, they gave us a great nation state that, we're, that is even now. Oh, so what's happened today? Why are we? The center. They operate to the center. Mm -hmm. Republicans, for instance, were one million short of registrations of Democrats in those days. But because of cross-filing, they could enter Democratic primaries. And I think you're going to see that kind of thing emerge under our new primary system. You see a whole new group of common sense, centrist men and women running for office. And, uh, and getting elected. <laughs> well, that's that's right, optimistic so, okay. <laughs> that's I like that thought. Dolly, I think you have a little bit different perspective well, on the narrative. You know, I'm thinking about politics now. You got me, I, I listen to what I hear and I get absorbed in it. You know, Bill Clinton, on the occasion of his, um, of the groundbreaking for his library in, Ar in Arkansas, in a torrential rainstorm, is, uh, delivered his famous quote where he said that politics is the art of telling better stories. Simple as that, telling better stories. And I, I think about it, you know, he's the only Democrat in the last 30 years who's been a storyteller. The rest of them have been wonks. Pardon me. Um, and poli like policy. But it's like the, the Republicans have told better stories and the Democrats have been more rational and they've been wonkish. What's happening with this election is it's kind of reversing and Romney's a little bit have, has a wonkish tendency and Obama's the orator. So we'll see what happens when they, when they go head to head. But I, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, and so I follow this great planning theorist named Jim Throgmorton. And Throgmorton's famous saying is that planning is persuasive storytelling about the future. You've got to tell people something they believe in and something they want to get behind and get them all on the same page together. So when I think of narrative, I think it's a way of telling stories that people can buy into, and you want to get them on the same page. And if I define what's wrong in California today, it's that they're not on the same page at all. And that's the number one chore. And we have to invent a narrative that people can, of different stripes can, can come to. And so Kevin is already alluding to this, that there is a, a, a centrist position that would weave together elements of Republican and Democrat and could reach the, the, the broader middle, the 60% middle of the, uh, of the electorate. But I think that, you know, getting people on the same page is the missing ingredient in America today. And I think we're getting closer to maybe figuring out how to do that. But at least we are. I don't know about the politicians. But it sounded to me like Kevin was saying the new primary system, some changes in the institutional structure of California may facilitate that. It sounds to me like you're saying that it's more of a story that the electorate needs to adopt so it's less institutional and you know mechanisms. It's more uh, sort of the way people think about themselves. Those are not opposed. I mean, I, I think you need to have the institutional structure for the story to you know, have you know a vehicle mm -hmm. uh, to move forward. But an institutional structure without a story is not going anywhere either. You need to have both of these pieces. Well, I, I'm um, 
uh, born 1940, so I came of age in the in the in the 50s um, when we were building this great nation state. And California was part of the solution in the minds of my generation, which is not the boomer generation. I belong to the silent generation, although I've not kept silent, but I should. <laughs> Don't you belong I, to the greatest generation? Oh, no, the greatest in World War II. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was I five-year-olds <laughs> in the war. But I, uh, California was part of the solution when I was growing up. When, when, I, when I was with kids in high school or we were working at Yosemite National Park in the summer, or making our plans for college and our, for our careers, uh, we looked, to, uh, looked around us and we saw uh, uh, encouragement. Uh, we saw the fact that California was, uh, was and, and we, we wrote that story about, you, you, we wrote a story very similar to the Latino story you're talking about, that we're, gonna, we're going to stay and be there. And um, in, in my particular family background, my great-grandfather came from Ireland in 1852 uh, in, in in my particular age group, uh, some 27 of my cousins went to, co went to college because of places like San Francisco State and uh, Chico State and San Jose State and University of California, Berkeley, et cetera. So it was an unprecedented uh, explosion. Now, we can't, we can't necessarily recapture that, nor should we try to. We have to be cha more chaste in the expectation. If we Californians, looking back to that time, say, oh, we want that time back, it's never going to come back. You can try and spend your way back into it, and it'll just absolutely break, the, break uh, the state. It'll, just, it'll destroy us. We have the example of France, for instance, where uh, the New York Times says this morning that 54 percent of the GNP is public sector spending. We have Spain, where an entire generation of young people is, what are they? Something like 28 percent unemployed. Something, something just ferociously even higher. Even higher. Yeah. Uh, absolutely ferocious. So we have warnings. We have warnings in Greece. And we're a nation state, too. We, 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 we are entitled to mention ourselves alongside them, although we're not possessed of full sovereignty, but we operate that way in terms of our economy. So the warning has been there that, it's not, that the unearned increment is not going to be because, as I pointed out in my book, Golden Dreams, uh, when California became uh, the most popular state in the, na in the nation in the early six, late mid-60s, you had articles in Look Magazine how how well people could live on unemployment down at the beach, and they're there with Ray-Ban glasses and looking really cool at the beach. Well, those days are over. Uh, those, and they were just mi mild to begin with. People worked, worked very hard to create this California that we have. So uh, that's why Dow's sense of a, of a resident workforce as part of the population here is, uh, now Dow, I have uh, three Latina granddaughters sending to good schools paying for it, so I want you to know that I'm going to be part of creating this workforce. If they Thank move you. out of the state, I'll be broken hearted. <laughs> uh, I've got to get them to speak more Spanish because I want them to, uh, to uh, be able to make the right moves when they get employment in the future. But the cultural, the cultural dimension of where we're heading doesn't mean that Anglo-America is going to disappear. Far from it, it's going to be a golden age for Anglo-American. It doesn't mean that Asian-American or Latino-American. Uh, I, remember, I remember the extraordinary uh, a development when uh, the uh, Latino population became the political majority was in 2000, wasn't it? Earlier 1999. Uh, the, not, not political, the, the population. Majority. Population. And uh, there wasn't, there were, you know, people thought there was going to, suddenly the place was going to turn into Quebec, but uh, where it, it didn't turn into, <laughs> it didn't turn into Quebec. There was no secessionist movement, etc. We all, uh, and, and we live in a city, for instance, here in Los Angeles, where even Mayor Villagorosa is saying no to public sector unions. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that a return <laughs> forward to politics? That there could be, there could be some, uh, some, some, the ability to negotiate can come forward uh, uh, in, in the in the future. But uh, but the idea of waste and uh, California as a place to drop out, it's going to become increasingly competitive. You, people used to come to California. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go find myself. California dreaming. Yeah, that, those days. Those days are over. Uh, you can have a nice dream, but you also have to work. You have to perform. High performance. Whatever you're doing. It doesn't mean everybody has to ha be a PhD uh, or, or an entrepreneur. It means that whatever you are, you have to be very good. The state's going to prize high-level performance. Now, especially if you look at this, uh, the littoral, the area between San Diego and uh, Marin County, 
which is basically the footprint of Spain and Mexican California, where still 70% of the population still live. You can make the argument that that is, right now, the sector of the most highly educated people on the planet, the most affluent people on the planet, other than Monte Carlo. Uh, which is just a <laughs> small little... Uh, you, you, in other words, you run through those statistics and you see that there is a kind of growing complexity to our culture, kind of globalization, that is not going to be tolerant in the long run of political dysfunction. What would happen uh, if, it, if the political dysfunction continues, there'll be even further localization uh, of government and government solutions. Jerry Brown is beginning to su suggest that. Governor Brown is beginning to suggest that if state government re continues to remain dysfunctional, uh, people will just uh, start to ignore it, forget about it. And now you say, well, they'll still pass uh, laws up in Sacramento. Well, they'll pass laws how much animal fat can be in lipstick, things like that. <laughs> Over a period of time, the consent of the government will be will be withdrawn from from the Sacramento game, if it doesn't uh, behave well, itself. Well, let's let's talk about one of those prominent laws, and that is Proposition 13. Uh, this was a citizen initiative that limited property taxes, following the home price explosion in the 1970s. Uh, it's perceived today as something unchangeable in some ways. Uh, as it protects homeowners, uh, but some also feel that it's one of the reasons for the imbalance in the tax system and some of our fiscal problems. Could you, each of you talk a little bit about maybe the narrative around Proposition 13 and uh, what do you think is possible historically and currently? Jack, that's such an old law. I don't know why you want to talk about it anymore. Still on the books. Yeah, it affects me in a big way, uh, coming here from another state, because uh, yeah. I end up having to pay the taxes that people who've owned houses here for 20 years aren't paying, right? So I find it rather unfair. Yeah, every newcomer suffers that same fate. <laughs> when I first that doesn't in, make it me any uh, more uh, you know, positive about it. When I first rolled into Altadena, I had the highest education on the block in the worst house. Um, and the people next to me, they, it was all seniority. How long you've been in California? Well, you know, I mean, seniority is a value we respect, don't we, in, in America? I mean, I, I'm for seniority now. <laughs> 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 you know, you, you, you had to pay your dues. Um, but <laughs> Prop 13 was kind of immoral in what happened because they, they made an emergency act that was really essential, and then they threw the keys away so you couldn't change it later. Uh, that was a bit hasty. But it, it was a panic, a full-blown panic. I've been doing some research on the history of house prices. Did you know that California's house prices were just about equal to the, the nation's? All the way through about 1970, there was hardly any difference in house price. And then the 70s came and it just exploded. Uh, the year before Prop 13 passed, uh, California's prices went up 25% in one year. And then, they, of course, they had the initiative to stop that. And the way you stop it is a citizen in initiatives. You know, the citizens will do anything if, you, if, you, if they have a good story in their heads. And the story was that old people are being abused. They're going to be forced out of their houses. They are being forced out of their houses. Greedy government. They have a surplus in Sacramento, which they did at that time. Greedy government. And what we're going to do is we're just going to cap it. And we're going to roll back assessments to 1975, before the big increase. Uh, my press release is coming out. Everybody's after me. Sorry. Um, we're going to roll back assessments, and we're going to then, instead of having your, um, your property taxes set at 2.6% of your value, which is kind of high, we're going to set it at 1%. And then we're going to freeze that forever and only let it grow by 2% per year. So they basically put uh, taxes down to one third of the former level and then let it grow 2% 2, 2 per year. Inflation went 4% per year. And so basically you're just sort of going downhill. But it worked. Even, even with this crazy design, it worked because they had a surplus. And the genius of it is you put the burden on the people who weren't here yet. Because the ones who aren't here, see, they don't vote. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't vote. And so you put it on the next uh, generation. And so people would show up, and prices were rising, and they would come in paying even higher prices, and their high taxes subsidized 
the old ladies who were going to be forced out of their homes otherwise. That's how the story is supposed to go. And it worked pretty good, by and large, until recently we had a mishap. The whole thing depended on prices rising continuously. That's what it's designed for. But after the crash, the big crash, the jig is up. It doesn't work anymore. And furthermore, the old ladies who you were fo worried about being poor, they're the ones living in the million dollar houses, paying this much taxes. And the people who were supposed to be arriving and the rich people are going to buy the houses, that's their kids. And uh, nobody can, the young people can't afford to buy houses. They're the ones who are abused now and poor. It's the young, not, the, not the, the older. And the big problem comes down to right now, the crisis in California, as we all know, is who is going to buy your house? And we're not so sure about that anymore. But we have a lot of older people, baby boomers. And one thing older people do is they sell houses. And they sell houses to younger people. And there's, it's all out of whack right now. So basically, the Prop 13 story was a good story for the emergency at the time. It's not a good story for our emergency of today. But it's locked in place, and we're sort of stuck with the old story. And we're, we're just gridlocked. You know, uh, Zal, uh, my friend Mike Davis, uh, in one of his books, points out. He's a good friend. He's a good friend. We're, we're good friends. We, he, he's a Marxist, I'm a Whig, and we get along very well. <laughs> We're going to have a bar someday. I'm going to run the right side of the bar. He's going to run the left side of the bar, part 10. But Mike Davis p talks about that. He calls it the, I'm almost quoting now, the, un, the biggest windfall of unearned increment in the history of the human race that never in, in, has anything been like the appreciation of Cal, sta, uh, California real estate during this time. And it's a mysterious absolutely mysterious to this day. I don't think anybody has really come up with a full explanation for, for what happened, except for the fact that California was so successful, it became so desirable that the basic commodity shelter, which we all must have, just shot up. Although we didn't experience comparable development in groceries or uh, clothing or... Well, uh, those environmental resources I was talking about before are part of the problem, actually. We could have gone the route of Texas and just level everything and build like crazy. But we did. We decided to actually protect the mountains, protect the oceans, and, and our cities are constrained. They're confined. And as they grow, they put pressure on, on their periphery, and a little bit of pressure drives prices up. Furthermore, one more little piece to that, it's not just that, it's there's a delay. So that when you want to get approval, as developers know, approval for a project, you've got to wait two years, three years, Meanwhile, prices are going up. And so the pressure builds in, while we're waiting for the delay. So if we could figure out how to do the CEQA review quicker, that would keep prices from inflating. But then, uh, wait a minute, I'm responding wrong. That's the solution to an old problem. We don't have that problem anymore. So it's all upside down. We can't make our policies, Jack. So what should we do about Proposition 13 today? Or can anything be done? Or well, should anything be done? If we had. If we had a legislature that met only every, like it used to when we were functioning, met only every other year for six months, uh, that would be a step in the right direction. If we had some kind of alleviation of term limits. I remember as state librarian for 10 years testifying uh, one day before uh, Assemblywoman Reyes from Fresno. And I called my wife up and said, gee, I'm getting on in ages. I just testified before the head of the the budget committee that I'm responsible to, to someone who's younger than our oldest daughter. So that was a, a movement, uh, <laughs> a, a passage in life. She was from Fresno. And then I watched her as she just developed this extraordinary expertise in finance and government. And then I also watched her reach term limits and have to go back to Fresno, where she is now. And that we trained that. Now you can say, well, she enters local government. I don't know if that's the case. I think we need to get uh, professional politicians back in Sacramento. People who, but professional, <laughs> people who also have the ability to have jobs also outside, as long as there's not conflict of interest, who understand what it is to work <laughs> and to hold uh, uh, to our true citizen legislators, go up there for six uh, uh, week, uh, months every other year, hang out at Frank Fats and the Torch Club, drink a little Maker's Mark, smoke some cigars, and cut deals that then sustain. <laughs> 
Can we do uh, without the cigar smoking and the yeah, rest? Well, of the okay, I, I'm, I'm just showing my, my time in life. <laughs> whatever the current, whatever the current recreational uh, rituals are. But that's how they did it, though, didn't they? Yes, that's how they did it. <laughs> yeah. That's how they did it. That's how they did it. That's how the uh, the Latino delegates from Southern California got along with the. The, the Republican Masons from Oakland with the big double-breasted suits and, and how they got along with Claire Engel from up in Tehama County and got along with Pat Brown from San Francisco, et cetera. All these and, uh, these, and, and how uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dorothy Donahue of Bakersfield got through the, uh, the Higher Education Act of 1960, which is astonishing. There should be a statue to her in Sacramento. Astonishing. This is a very conservative, uh, old-fashioned woman who was a her career was in uh, high school administration who put through a utopian master plan for education in California the, the higher education act now it was brokered and helped design by Clark Kerr and, and President Coons of Occidental etc cetera, etc cetera, but it had to get through the through the legislature and she she did that so the, we need those people back uh, what is the use of saying oh well we've got uh, this and that and the other and turnover, et cetera, if, if, if there's a massive incompetence or ref <laughs> refusal to negotiate. Th those politicians who created this nation state, they liked being politicians. They liked going to their local world and, and getting reelected and sent back there and, 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 uh, as, a, as a calling. And incidentally, you can say, oh, well, corrupt. They weren't corrupt. The e evidence of corruption in California, I mean, real corruption, uh, in all these years is minimal. You can't name any major, major, major scandal. Not uh, Chicago. No, no, it's not. Uh, so these, these people, for all their frailty, all their humanity, the John, uh, you saw, I saw the last group of them come through when I was in State Librarian. I saw Ken Matty, Republican from Fresno, and Willie Brown, Democrat from San Francisco. I saw the last of them come through. Stan Satham from Chico, mm -hmm. Democrat. These were a uh, high... Uh, highly accomplished uh, legislators uh, who, who were proud of what they did and saw that they're not going to go home saying, oh, I created an impasse. I voted no. They wanted to tell people what they voted yes on. Thank you, Kevin. I want to um, conclude really with a question for Dowell, and that is you, uh, we mentioned earlier that your report is coming out tomorrow. And we're really hoping that uh, you might give us a little sneak preview of what some of the findings are. So uh, we can say we came to the Athenian group and we got the information in advance. <laughs> Is there anybody from the press in the room? Because this information is embargoed until two, 10 a.m. tomorrow. Nobody from the press? I'm a contributing editor of the LA Times. I'm not going to be. <laughs> I'm not going to betray a colleague. Kevin, would you leave, please? <laughs> All right. Well, um, it's it's not actually any big surprise that the old projections were really high. They were bullish, unreasonably bullish in a bullish time, and the new projections are a lot lower for California's growth. Um, I can't say exactly how much lower, but, um, uh, you know, it, you're going to have to wait at least a decade for the growth to happen that was expected. And that's good news and bad news. You know, if you're in the business of building things, that's kind of bad news because you'd like to have more growth. If you're in the business of paying for things, it's good news because you don't have to pay for as much right away. Uh, but I think it buys us more time to get things right. California is not in a, in a good position right now to do anything. So having a little respite is, is not bad. And it will rebound um, after uh, 2020. And Kevin, I have one piece of, of uh, one finding. There's a lot in this report. So, but one thing of interest to you is you were talking about that, that white minority that, you know, that it's shrinking and withering away. And it doesn't appear from the data that the white population is actually going to shrink its share of the total has been declining. It's not 50% anymore, it's 42% of the total. But in absolute numbers, there's 14 million non-Hispanic whites in the year 2030. 14, that's more than the entire population of all but three states. And so, as I had a conversation with one person one time, he said, 
so how many whites do you need? And I said, well, <laughs> I don't know. 14 million is a big number. It's a big number. So I mean, it depends we, how much Wonder Bread you're baking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that so that might be good news for some people. I mean, not need to worry about it. I think I think part of the problem is that Californians get traumatized by there's a story someone tells and they exaggerate it. And if you're not sure about the answer, there's always some political operator who will exaggerate it for you and scare the pants off you and get you to vote for Proposition X. We do that all the time here. And we make these knee-jerk decisions on major policy. It's quite frightening. I, I'm not a major fan of direct democracy for that reason. It's too many long-term decisions made too hastily and with too little discussion and no compromise. It's either thumbs up or thumbs down. I mean, that's the worst thing about it. If you could talk about the proposition and negotiate it, you'd get a much better deal. Well, that's why my high school classmate, Jerry Brown, uh, <laughs> uh, who initially, uh, from St. Ignatius High School, San Francisco, California, uh, who initially um, tried to negotiate the same way Governor Schwarzenegger tried to negotiate, is now trying to do an end run around the legislature and go directly to the people, which if that proposition passes, the so-called millionaire tax, as I say, it'll buy us a couple years more, but it will basically be a sugar high, a sugar high. It won't be solid nutrition. It won't be the renegotiation of the covenant that we need. We really need to, to say that in our time, are we going to throw away California in our time? Are, is this what we're going to do? We, this has to be a sort of pervasive, almost evangelical uh, 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 conviction on a, a secular evangelical conviction uh, amongst us. Was this why we built this great nation state? Is this what the Golden Gate Bridge is all about? Is this what uh, Los Angeles City Hall, is that what USC is all about, to throw away our civilization? I don't think so. Uh, but then again, if cultures as highly developed as Greece and France can do it, and Spain, <laughs> yeah. what, what, do we want to follow there? But I mean, is, it, is that what we want on our watch, to throw this state away? And I think, that, that, I think we're going to have to have a near-death experience. Uh, like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, we're going to have to be hit by lightning and fall from our horse in a trance uh, to, before we sort of say, well, what's this all about? Let's behave ourselves. Let's pay attention and not just pass these. Further complicate. Let's grow up and be political. Let's cut some deals. Well, you know, well, I think these are pretty stimulating ideas uh, from uh, both Dow and Kevin. It should have uh, got all of us thinking. I could see some of us clapping for some, some clapping for, an, uh, for other ideas. So I'd like to now uh, open it up. Uh, we open to some questions. So uh, let's hear from the audience. Yes. Uh, we have a microphone. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Okay. And, uh, Thank you. Use the um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was and, a discussion. Oh, excuse me? Hey, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm yourself? Uh, Terry Stevenson. I work with the Burbank City Attorney's Office. Graduate of our MRED program. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, he's the graduate. <laughs> oh, a, few, a few years ago, um, there was some discussion regarding the idea that, that we'd reached the point where piecemeal solutions were not going to work, that we had to have a constitutional convention. And in fact, there was some thought that, that would, there was a chance it might even make it to the ballot. That all disappeared. Um, do we need that type of thing now? Is, is, is now time to do that? If you tried to have a constitutional convention in California today, it would make the food fight in Animal House look tame in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it, it, there, it, it's, 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 there's not the consensus, there's not the political skills for a convention. Don't forget, I mentioned the convention of 1879, which is our last constitutional convention. You had an alliance of the Working Man's Party and the Republican Party. How's that for um, uh, odd fellows, the odd couple? Uh, uh, we don't have that particular culture. I don't think we have to tinker with the machinery. I really don't think we have to tinker with the machinery. I think the legacy of pro progressive government that we got from 1911 uh, to 17, we have get, get rid of a lot of uh, harassing legislation I'll pay attention to the environment, I understand that, but a lot of harassing legislation against the private sector, uh, 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 liberate a sense of energy and creativity in California, and uh, I, I don't think we need to tamper with it. You watch what would come out of a convention. I mean, 
you watch. This place would, would huh? It would be scary. Yeah. It would be scary. It would make North Korea look progressive. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now you've gone too far, Kevin. <laughs> Dell, did you have any view on that? Or? Uh, no, I agree with Kevin. And you agree with Kevin? Okay. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Maurice Turner, class of 04 MPA. Uh, one of the key ingredients in the American dream is that, that story that we all hear about uh, being able to work hard and build our own hopes and dreams and have this home that we own so we can raise our family. What's the pervasive story that you think that we can tell folks as young as myself and even the generation after me as to why we should invest in working hard and actually buying a home in California? And if you can't convince us to buy a home in California, then what do you think would be that fundamental tax base that the state can run off of if that's not possible? Uh, if you exam I don't know anything about your background, but I'll tell you about my background. My father was a, a machinist, a factory worker in San Francisco, and um, uh, he didn't finish the eighth. He finished the eighth grade. He finished two years of high school. They went to CC camp during the Great Depression, etc. So um, certainly the opportunities were there. Uh, uh, if you examine your own life again, I don't know what your background is. You, Etc. But there's a good chance that that the majority of us are doing a little bit better than, than our parents, and uh, uh, can't continue to say that we're going to uh, do that incrementally. I think that there are the European the European model of families staying together and the Asian model of families staying together is going to come into our society, strictly because you can't really expand out into the horizon forever and eat up everything. So we're going to live a little bit more densely as we have 60 million people by 2040. We'll live a little more densely. Families will stick together. Remember the classic Chinese home with the older family, the third generation, the middle generation out working and active, and then the younger generation, the children, and the Oma and Opa helping out with the children, etc. I think family solidarity is going to, and I think if you look at the immigrant groups that maintain their family solidarity, uh, despite the sort of dissociation of of family solidarity in this country, you'll see they're getting along very well as they pool their resources. Well, and well, let me take a, a crack at it, because the gentleman's point is, is about, it's about yeah, intergenerational mobility, but it's also about mobility in your own career over your own lifetime. And um, he raises a, a, a serious doubt about can California's uh, real estate economy exist if people don't have any faith in buying homes. Now, there's some pessimists out there right now who are saying that the homeownership rate is going to really dive in California. But the biggest dive I've seen is four percentage points, like from 56 to 52 percent. But they make, but they, and the words they use are really scary, which actually, you know, undermines the market more. And if the number one principle I found in determining um, home buying rates is not interest rates, as we can tell, that doesn't do it. And it's not even the, not the price of housing either. The key thing is whether or not the prices are going up. In states like, like North Dakota, where prices have gone down, the homeownership rate of young people just sinks. Because why would you buy a house if it keeps going down? Just wait. Just wait until they wait forever. Well, and, and then conversely, in California or in Massachusetts, when prices were booming, the ownership rate actually rose because people had incentive to get on the, on the wagon. All right, well, that's where we're at. We're, right now, we're waiting for some reason why people should buy houses. And they won't jump until prices start to rise. And that's the big question mark, is what's going to make them rise? I mean, you could, what's going to do it? You're going to have some kind of big employment boom? Or you're going to have, the demographics are not good right now because it's sucking the bottom out from under the, the market. There's not enough young people. There's just not enough young people. And the young people are the ones who are going to have to come in and flood the market and push the prices. And there's too many older people selling. So we have a problem right now. But the good news is, I think, in this recession, everybody has overreacted. And there's people who are waiting who really, they just want to buy a house. If it goes up 2% per year, you make 10% you make per year on your equity. And where can you make 10% on your equity? There's nowhere. Not a single place you can do that. So just a 2% rise is a good deal. We're going to get it this next year. Uh, I, I also think anthropologically grand, grandparenting and extended families will uh, come back. And, and, and already with the immigrants, it's that families will pool resources, for instance, 
uh, my wife and I. I got two sons. Pardon me? I got two sons. <laughs> They're not living with me, but we're pooling resources. Okay. <laughs> Al, I hope you're nice to them so they come back and take care of you someday. I was always very nice to my children. They've been very nice to me. <laughs> I'd be extra nice to my grandchildren. But I, uh, I, I really think if you look at the real estate market today about how many grandparents are helping with down payments for, for housing, it's a big phenomenon yeah. that, uh, that's out there. And, and I think it's going to continue more. And, uh, or, or if it's not family, et cetera, there'll be associations, church, synagogue groups, et cetera, that will help people. Uh, on, on the credit union model of to get in, to get into housing, uh, because uh, otherwise the society just won't. It won't. There'll be just too much tension in the society, too much dissociation. I have a question right here, I think. Yeah. The, the, the focus. Uh, why, I'm Cynthia could Nelson, actually, 80, uh, 84 graduate. Yourself? Oh, Cynthia Nelson, Cynthia. Um, graduate, 84, MPL, MBA, long time ago. Um, but why the emphasis on home ownership? Why is that so important? I know that sounds like a stupid question, but what is wrong with having a greater share of rental um, um, uh, households? I mean, there's a, you need flexibility. There's a lot of reasons why rental housing now might be a preferred mode of housing tenure. I'm not sure that you know, increasing home ownership rates is necessarily the solution. Well, home ownership is not for every, everybody. Um, it, during the big boom, everybody was trying to buy houses, and it got out of control that way. You know, it's a traditional thing about it's the I give you a, Jeffersonian uh, democracy of. Yeah, exactly. It goes even earlier. I'll give you a quick, might sound a little pompous, but I always sound a little pompous. Uh, <laughs> you go back to the you go back <laughs> to the 17th century. 17th century, and the home provided the for the Puritans for the for a very strong Anglo-Protestant culture that in uh, the 17th century, in the mid-Atlantic culture, culture, but especially New England culture, the home provided the narrative. The family was the unit. The home provided the narrative. We're here. This is our family, et cetera. That's why so many American novels, for instance, are tied up Scarlet O'Hara with Tara, et cetera, which, with the actual physical place that you anchor there, and that's the narrative. And consequently, uh, uh, rental rental uh, renters did not have narratives. Renters were seen as a, um, uh, as we come into the 20th century, renters were seen as a group, immigrant group, people off the boat, work, uh, uh, renting. When you entered into an historical cycle of American life, you became a homeowner. That, that had been fixed since the 17th and 18th century. That's gonna, that is changing now, I agree, I agree with what you say. And there's other modes of, of home ownership cooperative shares you could buy in, in corporations that, that, uh, that you, in effect, pay rent to yourself, et cetera. There's all sorts of models that will be evolving uh, in the future. But still, uh, home ownership, I think, will not be detached from that, uh, that powerful American narrative it, it, automatically. It, it'll, just take, it'll take a long period of time for that to happen. So, I mean, I, I agree with Kevin, but let me just defend the, the multifamily renters, because I've been a big advocate of more rental housing all through the 90s we didn't build nearly enough multifamily. And, and, and if you just do any kind of, I, I'm a very limited historian, I just look at 1960. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that, to me, that's old. But do, do you know what, what share of construction in 1960 in California was multifamily? It was like 48%. And in 1970, 46%. In 1980, 46%. Nearly half of the construction in this state for the last three decades, up to 1990, was multifamily. Then in the 90s, it went down to 24% and stayed down there early part of the 2000s. And the whole time I was saying, okay, I don't get it. Here's a time when we're all concerned about housing affordability. Here's a time when we're concerned about sustainability and smart growth and fighting urban sprawl. Why do we have less multifamily now than we did back in the days of the 60s? What's going on? And the answer turned out was that we didn't have any young people in their 20s. We lost people in their 20s, took the bottom out of the construction market for uh, multifamily. But now we're starting to build multifamily again. I say go. Build as much as multifamily as you can. Build it as dense as you can, in clusters. And if you overbuild, more power to you. <laughs> as long as you don't own it. Uh, I'm not going to buy it. Yeah. Not now. <laughs> but that's what we need. We do need multifamily. We had a shortfall, a shortage of it. Any other question that we have for the 
Yes. Sorry, I didn't see you over there. Please introduce yourself. I am Karen Mack, and uh, I'm not going to tell you where I went to school because you'll probably kick me out of here. Um, uh, uh, um, I, you know, to me, it feels like the essential question is how do we get people to care? You know, what is it that will make people, you know, this, this older generation that we talk about of, you know, white people and, you know, people who have attain success, care about this younger generation that's immigrant and very diverse, but that holds the key to the future of California. Right. Um, and how do we get our politicians to care like they used to care about, um, you know, building schools and roads and, you know, the kind of infrastructure that makes life wonderful? Um, and so, you know, to me, that is the essential question. And it's, you know, it's, I think there's a morality that's kind of missing. Um, and, you know, um, how do we get that back, you know? I, I think that's an outstanding question. And, um, you know, there's two parts to the answer always. That you, you do want people to have a sense of morality and an obligation that's, that's useful never sufficient. It never is enough. You have to have one more ingredient. You have to show what's in it for people to care. And so I think the way I, the way I frame the, the political argument for caring, or why people should care, is we have to reestablish the sense that we're connected. Reestablish the idea that, that, that there's an interdependence. Reestablish the idea that these other people, whoever these other people are, they are important because they support me indirectly. They support me in the housing market. They support me as workers, and I need them. And we don't have that sense anymore. We think we're all individuals, all you know, cowboys riding on the range by ourselves without, without any sense. And, and the simplest way I've found to make this connection is to show people diagrammatically, if I have my PowerPoint here, I'll show you my, yeah, is that basically all the tax money in California is going to these young people. They're sucking up our tax dollars. And the good people are middle-aged, and they're the taxpayers, and the tax eaters are these young people. And they're taking all our money, and they're not even the same ethnicity. So why should we do that? That's how I frame that argument. Well, and then lo and behold, what happens, you know, I'm being a demographer. See, I, see Kevin predicts the past. I, I predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as a demographer, I, I can out-predict any economist. I always say economists, you know, the most important thing is interest rates and, you know, unemployment trends. They can't predict those things three months ahead. I can predict 20 years. I can say that in 20 years' time, everybody in this room is going to be 20 years older. <laughs> including that second grade girl who's sucking up all that tax dollars, lo and behold, she's going to become 27 years old. And she's going to become a new worker and a new taxpayer herself and a new home buyer. And that's why I should care about her. I need her. I need her to grow up and be really a productive um, citizen of California. But we don't think that way. We think we're individuals and we think in the, in the present. We don't imagine that people have a life cycle. Now, how that can happen? We need storytellers like Kevin to, to paint the picture and to put people into moving time, and which you can only see over decades. You can't see that in one year, five years, 10 years. You need decades. I don't know, what was the story with Pat Brown era? They were, they were investing in schools. Oh, the there, there, was, there, there was politics in Pat Brown's era. For instance, the California Water Plan, Proposition 1 in November 8, 1960, uh, only passed by well, one or two percent. I mean, it was, there was a real division. Uh, the Bay Area didn't pass it at all, didn't vote for it at all, because they didn't want all the water to go down to Southern California. I also think the private sector, in terms of caring, ha has things to tell us about, things that, that come from our churches, our synagogues, our entertainment, uh, our, our, uh, our um, cultural, recreational life, the, 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 um, the, the friendships formed by our young people, etc. Uh, the, the census, the census of 19... Uh, correction, the census of 2000, for instance, first revealed a curious and delightful obliviousness to uh, racial uh, discrimination on the part of young people, the un 18 and under. So that was, a, that was good news, wasn't it? I mean, in terms of looking forward to uh, uh, the, the culture of where people are, et cetera. 
when it comes to that kind of caring, that's that renewal in the private sector, uh, well, we, we have ways in our society where we, we can quicken that. Uh, for instance, um, one, of the, one of the big developments, as long as they don't become self-sealed, one of the big developments that's occurring now are these great mega churches in, uh, in cities, mostly non-denominational mega churches, that really create whole communities for people, whole communities of uh, recreation and, and care and assistance, et cetera. So I think, I think religion or philosophical organizations, cultural organizations, volunteerism, all those things that de Tocqueville in Democracy in America in the 1830s praised us for, that we Americans had a gift for that kind of vol volunteerism. And I think that uh, school spirit, loving, uh, you know, the Beach Boys saying, be true to your school. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the question of, of high schools, local libraries. What a thrill I had as state librarian to be given by the voters a half a billion dollars to build community libraries. And to see when we dedicate those libraries all up and down the state, this tremendous outpouring of emotion and love people had for their communities. Um, the thrill it was to, uh, to go and to sit in a huge classroom in Redwood City of predominantly Hispanic kids and have somebody read Dr. Seuss lyrics, sing Dr. Seuss lyrics, and these Hispanic kids whose first language were, were, was Spanish were, or, or spoke bilingual were laughing at all the right places. I, to me, I have a PhD from Harvard, but Dr. Suss, I can't understand. It's too complicated. <laughs> uh, but there they were. There they were moving along in two languages so successfully. Uh, there our culture is that we are getting along day by day. I take a uh, dash around the city to get down to USC from downtown where I live, etc. I love riding dash. I love to see people in their lives and the, and the drama of their lives and the extraordinary courtesy people lend to each other. Uh, across all kinds of differences, et cetera. Do we, do we lose sight of that in our culture today because we focus on when things go wrong? And we should focus, like down in Florida. We should focus on those things when they go wrong. But that's not the day-to-day -day behavior of American people. Extraordinary society. Uh, notice uh, that uh, people may be leaving uh, California <laughs> for economic reasons, but nobody's leaving the United States. So it's not a great big out, uh, out, uh, out migration. I mean, we're, we're, where are people going to go? North Korea, Lapland? I mean, where are you going to go? Uh, uh, so I think that the private sector has a lot to say about this. Look how well movies, do, motion pictures do that show people sticking together. Stand By Me or any kind of roll call of films. Now we have all kinds of films, everybody's shooting each other up, et cetera. I understand the testosterone young males like those kind of movies, et cetera. But look at all the wonderful movies we're getting about, about people helping each other out, making friends across uh, 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 I saw a movie recently with Denzel Washington um, taking the last Bible. Now, if this was in the future and there was an apocalyptic situation, he'd taken the last Bible across the country to uh, San Francisco to get it recopied, which is an unusual place to bring the Bible to get copied. But, uh, <laughs> and he forms, he forms this uh, young... A uh, young uh, uh, woman uh, helps him guide him and said, There's all, I mean, those are very hopeful kinds of things in our, in our popular entertainment. We absorb a lot of our subliminal attitudes. That's why we have to be we're cautious. I'm not for censorship. No, no, no. Because I'm a librarian. We don't do censorship. We've got to be very careful that we don't overload. There's a story this morning. Uh, a lot of national network television programs are losing of viewers. And some of them deserve to lose viewers because they don't give us a positive or, uh, uh, don't give us a hopeful mess, or let's just rephrase it. They give us a rather dis discard, uh, disjointed and uh, a mess about American life. So it's arithmetic, it's enlightened self-interest, which our founding fathers and mothers believed in that principle. It's also the other aspects of the culture, uh, uh, the, 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 the aspects of the culture that speaks to our subliminal self. That's why when, when there's some former MRED students uh, are here, and when I used to teach a little two-unit course on design and real estate development, I talked to them. You're helping people build dreams. You're helping people design their lives. You're helping, uh, and that's a major. That's caring. That's caring. That's very good. I'm that note of caring. Thank you for asking that question. I think we're going to end on that uh, note. 
I uh, want to really thank our two speakers for these provocative ideas. Thank you very much, Paul and Kevin. All right, Kevin, it's very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.